Now there's been a lot of talk, especially oh. in I know my own circle of friends, we've all been talking about Ebola virus. And earlier this week, mm -hmm. health officials diagnosed the first case of Ebola in the U.S. And this deadly disease has already claimed the lives of 3,000 people this year in West Africa. So joining us to share more about the deadly virus, we have Dr. Joanne Levin and Linda Riley from Cooley Dickinson Hospital in Northampton. Ladies, let's get right to it. First of all, let's talk about exactly what Ebola is. Good morning. Um, Ebola is a virus. It's actually named after a river in the Ebola uh, region of uh, uh, Uganda. And you, uh, it's a virus that's been known about since the 1970s. And it's almost always been show, uh, shown up in Central Africa. Um, and this outbreak is unusual because it's in Western Africa. And no one really expected to find it there. Now, how is it transmitted? Is it incredibly contagious? It is contagious, but only through touch, through through touch of body fluids or blood, uh, but not through the air. So that's that should be comforting for people to know that it's not. You can't get it from so walking by someone who even has the or disease. A cough or anything like that. Well, you don't want to be sneezed upon. Because so the you have body there are fluid. fluids in the mucus. Absolutely. So if you're uh, uh, three to six feet away from a patient, you're walking down the hall. You cannot get Ebola, but you don't want to touch their body fluids. From someone who's sick. Now, if someone who's not sick, they have no symptoms, even though they might have been contact, in contact with somebody else. If someone is not sick, they are not transmissible. You cannot catch Ebola from someone who is not sick. How did this become so big and so problematic? Because oftentimes we hear about these, but then they quickly become contained. How did this one uh, grow so big so quickly? Right. So in Central Africa, in the outbreaks that have happened before, generally it happened in smaller villages uh, where people didn't travel long distances and people sort of stayed in their, their little village and it was easy to contain. Uh, but this is different in several, uh, for several reasons. One is that it happened in West Africa, uh, West Africa where no one expected it, so it wasn't recognized right away. Um, and in addition, um, once uh, people started having Ebola, um, and then it got into the cities where people are, are in, in closer contact and in contact with larger numbers of people. So it sort of got out of control before it was able to be contained. So the way it has been in other uh, outbreaks. Right, right. 1970s is a lot different than, than today. Right, people travel mm -hmm. uh, long distances and, and living in the city is really different from a small village. Now we know there, there was a diagnosed case that was in the United States, this has caused a lot of anxiety. Right. What, is, what are the chances that this could actually spread to our community, to Western Massachusetts? Well, I have a lot of faith in our public uh, health system, and the CDC is taking this extremely seriously. So, this one patient came from Africa, and they've uh, contacted, they've they've found the uh, the people who might have been in contact with him and are con are controlling that. So, you sort of you sort of make a circle around the patient and try to control. Those uh, those people and, and watch them. Um, so I have faith that that little um, circle is going to be controlled. Mm -hmm. um, but because the outbreak is so out of control in West Africa, um, and people around the world travel a lot, it actually can come up anywhere in the world. It just happened to come up in the United States and Texas, but it could come. It, people could be found in London and Paris or anywhere. So Western Massachusetts is a possibility, although maybe somewhat less likely, but certainly is a possibility, and we are all uh, need to be prepared for the possibility of a patient who's been exposed or is sick coming to one of our hospitals. And, and regardless of the possibility or, or the statistical probability that it might come to Western Massachusetts, all area hospitals, and especially yours, are taking steps. If you don't mind telling us about the steps that you are taking. Sure. We're very lucky that we have the resources of Mass General and the Partners System. We've developed screening tools that are used for in the ED by both the receptionists and the nurses at the triage station. Everyone who comes into the hospital is asked if they've done any of the traveling and then are screened for the symptoms. Then we actually has a dev we have a designated place to put people so that they don't have to walk through the ED and potentially expose people. The staff have all had education. We have policies in place and we're actually at the point where we're going to be doing drills so that we can tweak our processes and make sure that they're as good as they can be. If you think about it though, the early symptoms are really pretty nonspecific. So people may also be going to the doctor's office as opposed to coming to emergency departments. Mm -hmm. So we've reached out to all of our doctor's offices as well. They have the screening tools. We've actually given them the personal protective equipment, the gowns and the masks and gloves so that they're prepared to take care of patients and to protect people in their waiting rooms and in their offices. That makes us feel 
wonderful knowing that hospitals locally are taking the steps, Cooley Dickinson is taking the steps to make sure that we're all safe. So thank you so much for shedding some light on this, letting us know a little bit more so that we're all educated and informed. Great to have you both here. Thank, thank you. Very thank much. you very much.